As part of the practical approaches to estimating the fatigue life of a part, we looked at how SN diagrams can be used for steels, for example. In the previous video, we covered a procedural explanation on how to find the expected life of a part for a given completely reversed stress value or a factor of safety for a known operation duration, that is, number of cycles. We did this by estimating the F coefficient that modifies the ultimate strength for the low cycle region and by estimating a starting value for the endurance limit. The lab specimen we looked at in our previous video, the one that is used to determine the fatigue strength values and the endurance limit, is a very carefully prepared sample with little to no surface imperfections, manufactured in the same way every time, and made with precise dimensions. Additionally, the alternating stress is a normal stress originating from the bending moment it is subjected to. If any of these conditions and parameters were to be changed, even the temperature of operation, the values of the endurance limit would inevitably change too. The endurance limit modifying factors, or the Marin factors, after what Joseph Marin identified in 1962, are a set of factors of values lower than 1 that can be used to have a better estimate of the endurance limit when endurance tests of parts are not available. By lowering the theoretical endurance limit, for example the 0.5 times the ultimate strength for steels, the whole line for high cycles is also lowered, which is consistent with the data obtained experimentally. We'll take a look at five of the main marine factors today, but be aware that there are many others that can be useful for parts subjected to specific applications like corrosion, electrolytic plating, which are basically metallic coatings, metal spraying, cyclic frequency, which is creep related and where slower cyclic rates with high temperatures result in a shorter life, and fret edge corrosion, which is related to microscopic friction between components, among others. All the values presented here can be easily looked up online by looking for marine factors or endurance limit modifying factors, but if you're using the textbook, section 6.9 of the 11th edition will have this information in it as well. Let's start by looking at the surface factor, Ka. Since stresses are usually highest at the surface, any imperfections or surface roughness will act almost as stress concentrations, which will increase the chances of localized plastic strains or crack initiation. Now remember that for fatigue calculations, we are not modifying and increasing the stresses with stress concentration factors. For fatigue, we are modifying and lowering the fatigue strength, or what you used to call the maximum allowable stress, and we do this by lowering the endurance limit with, in this case, the surface factor. As for many other concepts related to fatigue, the values for these factors come from experimental testing results. For the surface factor, we see that depending on the commercial surface finish, polished, ground, machined, hot rolled, as forged, and the ultimate strength of the materials, you obtain a distinct value for Ka. This plot of trends can be used directly to find Ka estimates, or if you prefer, you can use power curve equation fits of each plot, where the A and B coefficients are given for the different surface finishes, with A having different values for KSI or megapascals, of course. As the size of the part you're analyzing increases, the amount of the volume that is affected by high stresses increases too, and thus a higher probability of crack initiating. This increased chance is represented in the size factor Kb. For bending and torsion of a round rotating bar, using experimental data from several sources and fitting the lower edge of the scattered result and therefore obtaining very conservative values, we get two expressions for two different ranges of diameters, 0.3 to 2 inches and 2 to 10 inches, or in millimeters, 7.62 to 51 and 51 to 254 millimeters. Now, since not all parts undergoing fatigue are rotating shafts, we can calculate an equivalent diameter for non-round cross-section areas like rectangles, I-beams, and others. And it even works for round parts that are not subjected to a constant rotation of the idealized lab specimen. These exceptions are found through a very simple mathematical process that assumes that the critical area is the area where at least 95% of the maximum stress occurs, reference in the description below if you're interested in that. The loading factor, Kc, accounts for the fact that the relationship between the ultimate strength and the endurance limit is not the same when the sample is subjected to bending, torsion, or axial loading, or even a combination of two or more. For that reason, we use 1, no modification for bending, since the bending is what is used in the lab tests, 0.85 for axial, and 0.59 for torsion. When torsion is combined with other types of stress, you can set Kz to 1 and use the von Mises stress we studied during the failure criteria videos. Links below. A good exercise here is to prove how calculating a von Mises stress from an external torsion load only, which arises from the distortion energy criteria, yields 0.577 times the normal stress. 
If you can't prove this yourself, make sure to check the procedure in one of the videos in the description below. The temperature factor KD is a complex one. For many materials, decreasing temperature may actually increase the ultimate and yield strengths, but their ductility is vastly reduced. Since endurance limits are usually linked to the ultimate strength, we would think that low temperatures have a positive effect on fatigue. But as we saw with fractured toughness a couple videos ago, link below, and the lower ductility due to lower temperatures, smaller crack lengths would be required for rapid crack growth to fracture. High temperatures are also a cause for concern, since even temperatures above 40% of the melting temperature in Kelvin can give rise to phenomena like oxidation and creep. Whatever the case, we can find experimental curves for the temperature factor KD of different materials. For example, for steels, we use curve fit polynomials for experimental results, one for temperatures in Fahrenheit and one for Celsius, where ST over SRT is the ratio between ultimate strengths at the operating temperature and room temperature. And since the theoretical endurance limit is found as a fraction of the ultimate strength, and therefore it is a linear relationship, we call this ST over SRT ratio the temperature factor KD. However, and this is very important, if you're already accounting for this to find the ultimate strength and therefore the F coefficient for the low cycle region, you wouldn't need to use KD when estimating the corrected endurance limit. I'll bring this up step by step during the example of this video. Finally, and going back to a normal distribution example for material properties of several videos ago, there exists a reliability factor that will partially account for the scatter in the results that are obtained experimentally for the endurance limit. Just as I mentioned then, more sophisticated statistical analyses can be performed on experimental data, like even just understanding the distribution of your samples. However, as a conservative approach, and this is the main theme of this fatigue failure method, conservative, the reliability factors for an 8% standard deviation can be used to modify the endurance limit estimate. Let's put all of these into work with a simple example. And remember, the whole process for this fatigue life approach is focused on modifying the strength. The stresses remain the same, and there is nothing new to the process of calculating stresses that you already knew how to carry out during your Mechanics of Materials course. A hot rolled steel bar with an ultimate strength of 123.6 KSI has been machined to have a 1 by 2 inch cross section area. The part will be subjected to reversed axial loading in an operating environment of 580 degrees Fahrenheit. What is the fatigue strength for 50,000 cycles using a reliability of 99% for the endurance limit estimate? Understanding how this problem is solved is much simpler if we look at an SN diagram. My goal is to obtain the fatigue strength for n equal to 50,000 cycles. And to fully capture the behavior of the SN curve, I need to find the F coefficient and the endurance limit. Both the first estimate of the endurance limit, SE prime, and the F coefficient are functions of the ultimate strength. And since the part is going to be operated at 580 Fahrenheit, and we already know that the ultimate strength can change with temperature, the first calculation I should look at should be at the temperature factor or the ST over SRT ratio. By using a temperature of 580 Fahrenheit and using the first equation, which applies to Fahrenheit, I find that my KD factor is equal to 0.971. So if I know that the ultimate strength at room temperature is 123.6, the ultimate strength at the operating temperature would be equal to 120 KSI. With this information, I can do three things. I can label the ultimate strength on my SN diagram. I can find the F coefficient that I need for the low cycle region, and I can calculate the initial value for the endurance limit, following what we learned during the last video. Now, since I used the value of 120 KSI for the ultimate strength, instead of using the given 123.6 to find that initial value for the endurance limit, I'm in practice already using KD, the temperature factor. I could still use 123.6 to find SE prime and then multiply that value by KD, but that would result in the same 60 KSI for the initial value of the endurance limit. So this just means that if I'm using the ultimate strength at the operation temperature, I no longer have to account for the temperature using KD. Now to find the rest of the correction factors, the process is pretty straightforward. Let's begin with the surface factor. I mentioned that the steel bar was hot rolled, but it was machined down to have a 1 by 2 inch cross section area. 
For this reason, the surface finish will be that one of a machined part. Using the power curve equation fits for a machined finish and an ultimate strength of 120 KSI, we find that the surface factor is equal to 0 0.708. Finding the equivalent diameter of a rectangular cross section and using that diameter to calculate the size factor, we get a value for KB of 0 0.867 using the expression for diameters that are between 0 0.3 and 2 inches. Since the steel bar is subjected to axial loading, we will use a loading factor KC of 0 0.85. And finally, if I want to have a reliability of 99%, meaning that with a 99% confidence, this sample will have the endurance limit that I'm calculating, we find a KE value of 0 0.814. Putting all these values together, I find that the corrected endurance limit, which is the product of KA, KB, KC, KE, and the initial estimate SE prime, is equal to 25.5 KSI. This value can be located on the SN diagram. And with that, I can find the fatigue strength I was looking for. The A coefficient and the B exponent can be found using the expressions we derived in the last video. And using these values together with 50,000 cycles, I find that the fatigue strength is equal to 45.A KSI. Remember that this process is completely independent from calculating the stress of operation of the part. One thing is calculating the stress, and another one is calculating a reasonable endurance limit and a corresponding fatigue strength. The first one is one process you should be a master of, and should take no time or hesitation to complete accurately at this point. The second one, the one we did here today, is mostly procedural and therefore much more trivial. Back of the envelope calculations like these are still very useful today. Software that allows you to obtain more accurate results, with a huge as long as here, and that is, as long as you know how to use them properly, will still be helpful as well, but they take much longer to set up, and in many cases, and since all of these factors are obtained by using conservative values from experimental processes, this approach to estimating fatigue life is still preferred to have an initial calculation for initial designs and prototypes. In the next video, we will study how stress concentration factors and notch sensitivity values can be specific for fatigue applications, and static loading stress concentration factors should not be used. Thanks for watching.